that comes as it were to the kind of a catch hole you know, the answer here. Well, we're anti ecumenical. All this is bound to upset, as it were, those with whom we are in dialogue. This is what inspired the so called Chestahova Declaration that you want to be careful not to use all of these forbidden terms like corridentrix, mediatrix, uh, or be too loud mouthed about, uh, about uh, talking about the importance of invoking Our Lady, her advocacy. And the answer, very simply, is, is we will get genuine unity of all nations when we begin with Our Lady, not by excluding her. I shan't go into any further. There have been some excellent studies in Mary at the foot of the cross and volumes and other volumes have been published on the co-redemption to show, show quite clearly that's in the case of Cardinal Mercier, who is said to be a great medieval, a great ecumenist. But he approached it by beginning with Our Lady, not by excluding her. That is the difference. It's not a question of rejecting ecumenism, it's a question of knowing where ecumenism begins, and it must always begin with Our Lady. She is the common point of reference. If everyone would love her, we would solve the Ecumenic Commission in 24 hours. The big block to a successful ecumenism is precisely Marian Minimum. It's a very plausible position, uh, position, and I can assure you, if you make it publicly in the right places, uh, the places you better have your handy, handy uh, six, uh, uh, six shooter ready. Uh, you're uh, going to be the object of violence, possibly phys uh, uh, physical. Now we go on, as it were. Where I think I've illustrated enough, as it were, the pertinence of uh, recalling Genesis 3:15. If we love Our Lady, we won't be afraid because the victory is guaranteed. It doesn't matter how many people rise up in wrath, 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 wrath that she's going to crush the head of the serpent and those who deliberately refuse to honor, uh, honor, uh, honor, her, uh, honor her. That is the guarantee that we have and for the reason we should not be discouraged. Here. Now, the offensive approach, that sounds very bad in English, uh, as though you're going to offend people by clubbing them over their head with a with duck. By offensive, I simply mean, uh, simply mean a way of presenting in a positive way all the reasons, the significance, why this is a crucial uh, rule, and why, in fact, is so important, as it was in the past, uh, to encourage either by a council or by, or by the Holy Father to solemnly define precisely this mystery of Our Lady's role in the church, in the, in the whole of civilization, and in the order economy of salvation. It centers in this. She is a unique person. She does occupy a very powerful position. For better or for worse, for better if we we make make ourselves her children, or for worse if we opt for the other option. There are only two, either for or against, in this in this case. The, the four last things, two of them are heaven and hell. There is no intermediary intermediary uh, inter intermediary play. What I tried to do, uh, I tried uh, I tried to do is to uh, to, to to show, as it were, this in terms of the correlation between Genesis 1, 315, and the Apocalypse, chapter 12. Be few of us re remember that Apocalypse 12, that is the vision of the woman, should, should begin with the conclusion, concluding verses of chapter 11, where the seer, St. John, sees uh, this holy of holies in heaven opened up, and he sees the Ark of the Covenant, and the next verse is, what is the Ark of the Covenant? It's not a what, it's a who. It's the woman. This is the Holy of Holies. And it should give us some idea of what the Holy of Holies symbolizes the tabernacle. Our Lady, in some way, still, as it were, is the prime tabernacle dwelling place of the Word incarnate, the Savior. And she is, in a very real sense, the context, the container for that sacrifice. sacrifice. This is the message of Ecclesia of Eucharistia, of one of the last encyclicals of Pope John Paul II, and perhaps one of his, uh, one of his best. Calling our attention to a theme present in some of the great doctors of the past, like St. Bonaventure, but for the most part forgotten by theologians, even those who came after as well the Council of Trent, especially immediately preceding the Council. There are very few. Roschini, was, was the, perhaps, was the only, only one. You must also read Apocalypse 21. I saw the New Jerusalem as, uh, in the Protestant view. The New Jerusalem is a symbol of the heavens, heavens. 
in the view of St. John in Catholic tradition, the new Jerusalem is first of all Our Lady. It's a, it's just a woman in Genesis. It's first of all Our Lady, then the church, and then every soul. And you find that from St. Bonaventure and many others, all three interpretations, and they are re related to one another. The new Jerusalem coming down from heaven is none, none, none other than Our Lady as uh, the queen, the mediatrix in the church. The preeminent or literally translated from Vatican to supereminent per, 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 uh, uh, per person. What is the basis of her advocacy? Now, I just want to sketch, and I'll do it very, very briefly, uh, briefly because it's going to go off. <laughs> I won't finish. Uh, the first is her immaculate conception. To see, as it were, the possibility and the nobility and the quasi-infinite perfection of our redemption, St. Thomas, <laughs> in basically he's agreeing with Scotus here, uh, presupposes uh, the Immaculate Conception, the absolute predestination of Jesus and, Mar and, uh, and, 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 and Mary. This is why our redemption is so perfect, why it can be so perfect. This is why she is called Redemptrix. All the objection to co-redemption, it competes with our Lord, there's no place for her mediation there, it's the only mediator, etc. Uh, they become absolutely irrational in the context uh, of this, uh, uh, of, the, of the presentation, especially a blessed John Duns, uh, Duns, uh, From that we can see how to interpret, and I just put it here, and here, all of those wonderful signs, symbols, figures of Our Lady in the Old, uh, Old Testament, one of whom we meditated upon in this morning's reading. Esther is a figure of Our Lady. So is, Ju uh, so is Judith. So is Rachel. So is Mary, the sister of Moses. So is Sarah. The curious thing is there's also a man there who is Abraham, father of faith. But Abraham can represent God the Father, but he can also represent and, uh, Mary, the mother. Uh, Abraham had offered in place of Isaac uh, a ram. Our Lady didn't offer an animal in place of her son. All these things enable us to understand and to therefore a more direct exposition of the mediator, mediatory role of Our Lady in the work of some sometime called the objective redemption. Establishing a new order of existence called the economy of self before any one of us personally or individually is inserted into the true vine and grafted. Uh, incorporated into the body of Christ, there is a new order. It's no longer the fallen order consequent upon the sin of Adam and Adam. I want to stress that point because ultimately we shall see the need of a definition precisely to make clear to the vast mass of our brothers and sisters the reality of original sin and the need of redemption and the possibility of a redeemer, the possibility of redeemer concretely, concretely, is, uh, is uh, uh, illustrated with uh, the incarnation by way of the divine maternity, the redemption by way of uh, the assistance of a co-redemptrix. Not because Christ is inadequate, but because he is the wisest, best way to do it for all of us. We would find Christ far away if it were not for Mary. Hard to approach. Not the other way around that a lady blocks, she makes it, uh, makes it. But I want to stress this point. The need for the fifth dogma is precisely here because if there is one truth 